Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, what a difference a week makes virtually everything and everyone in the world affected by the coronavirus. And speaking of that, ag markets turned upside down. We'll talk to two analysts about it this week. Plus, there will come a time to get back in your garden. Gary has tips on breaking the hex of growing houseplants. And just before everything happening now, there was the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. We look back at what now seems like so long ago. Farm Week starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. As we said in the opening of the show, what a difference a week makes. Wherever you are, no matter where you live, in a big city or rural setting, all of us on the Farm Week team, and some of our team members are working from home right now, wish you the very best and nothing but health as all of us work through this difficult time. With that in mind, no question that right now virtually everyone in the nation impacted by the coronavirus outbreak. Some of today's content was produced just before things took a turn for the worst. You'll see that shortly. In the meantime, the U.S. reeling from the initial impact. Here's a recap of some of what's happened so far. USDA is among the government agencies putting together what-if scenarios in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Schools that close for an extended time would leave students who depend on free and reduced lunch without regular food. A program first used in 2009 called Pandemic Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or PSNAP, could be reinitiated. More money would be put on SNAP cards to allow purchase of food if schools shut down for an extended time. The administration is going to every department of government where there's certain programs that are already authorized that they can institute by the secretary of that department instituting them. I think the president's going to have those go forward. Meanwhile, the stimulus package approved by the House days ago would bolster paychecks and businesses hurt by the pandemic. A temporary repeal of taxes may be implemented as well. No matter what, it's a plan that will likely need a sequel. It's like the house is on fire. People are concerned about their, of course, their health and the health of their children. Uh, if they are losing their jobs because nobody's coming to the restaurant or whatever it is, then... Uh, we have to be there with some help for them. We have overcome bigger challenges in this country. Every time we have a disaster in others, it shows the very best of this country working together and coming together and actually making us stronger in the end. I'll make this commitment to everyone. The National Pork Producers Council is warning the White House the virus is exacerbating the already tight labor challenges facing the industry. In a letter from NPPC President Howard Roth, the availability of workers on weekends and off-time shifts is one challenge in the pens. But Roth adds the closure of schools forcing farm or factory working parents to stay home is a concern too, adding... The specter of market-ready hogs with nowhere to go is a nightmare for every pork producer in the nation. It would result in severe economic fallout in rural communities and a major animal welfare challenge. The NPPC is asking for expedited worker visas to help avoid bottlenecks in the supply chain. The president has spoken to the nation more than once and held news conferences backstopped by his task force. But those speeches have done little to stabilize the stock market, which has lost nearly a third of its value by the time we recorded this show. Those on the exchange were left with uncertainty over the economic impact of the virus as trading was halted twice after sell-offs triggered financial curbs. By the end of this past Monday, the biggest point drop in the Dow's history was in the books. It was the second largest percent drop ever, despite a momentary venture back into positive territory on Friday the 13th. Oil prices slipped lower as well. U.S. oil producers are caught up in ongoing tensions between Russia and OPEC over production levels. Domestic shale producers are caught up as their market evaporated. 
Gasoline prices dropped to a more than 11-year low. That may continue. Some commodity groups have canceled upcoming meetings out of an abundance of caution. Large events also were closed around the U.S. The Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo was already at the midpoint of a 20-day run when organizers and city officials ended the gathering early. Exhibitors and visitors were sent home after it became clear the virus had spread to the metro area. And so at the end of the day, uh, I will be signing an emergency health declaration, um, which will remain in place for seven days. So the big question on everybody's mind, money. Washington is scrambling in every way possible, including the development of a stimulus package that could involve sending checks to everyone in America. Details soon. At the same time, leaders from both parties working on plans to prop up every corner of the economy. The stock market hit especially hard, as you know. It was down another 1,000 points Wednesday morning as we prepared to record this show. Still, finance is a key issue we'll be watching carefully. Several stories around the USDA, including a report of one staffer hit by the virus in D.C. Some co-workers are teleworking now. But the agency says it is still open for business. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue recorded a video message released Tuesday reassuring the public that supply chains remain strong. In the video, he thanked those on the front lines of American food supply, from grocery store workers to truck drivers delivering the food to food service workers preparing the food. The USDA says it is also collaborating with a number of companies to deliver nearly a million meals to students in a number of schools closed because of the virus outbreak. Purdue says keeping school kids fed is a top priority of the president. The USDA is working with the private sector to deliver boxes of food to children in schools affected by the closures. He said the agency is using innovative strategies to make sure children are practicing social distancing but still getting enough to eat. Meanwhile, the USDA sent a letter to a large number of stakeholders Monday, emphasizing its commitment to food safety. In that letter, it says its Food Safety and Inspection Service, its Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, and its Agricultural Marketing Service are all on the job. Letter says the USDA will, quote, take all steps necessary to ensure continued access to safe and wholesome USDA inspected products. And finally, during this time, the USDA says it is staying creative and open to ideas, especially on two major fronts. Purdue urges those with solutions to feeding kids impacted by the outbreak to email the agency at feedingkids at usda.gov. For solutions impacting the nation's food supply chain, email at foodsupplychain at usda.gov. Purdue says the agency would especially like to hear from experts in the field. On a much lighter note, there will be a time, there will come a time to get back in the garden. Until then, you may want to work on your houseplants. In this story produced a few weeks ago, Southern Gardening's Gary Bachman says if you're feeling hexed where those are concerned, never fear, some plants are just easy to grow. Here's Gary. A recent poll revealed that the demand for houseplants is growing, but many people feel that they're cursed when it comes to growing plants. Let's look at a group of easy care houseplants that will break the hex. Sedums and other succulents may be the best easy care houseplants. There is a wide variety of shapes, sizes, and colors from which to choose. I really like the fine textured selections that look so soft to the touch. Fine leaf gold sedum creates a mass of brilliant yellow chartreuse gold foliage. This makes an excellent addition to a mixed container. Sea urchin sedum is unique with its silver green leaves with white edges that are needle-like. This is extremely tolerant of droughty conditions that enhances its easy care. Tricolor sedum is a matte forming selection. The leaves are tricolor, being green in the center with white margins and tinted with pink tones. I also like the selections that have long linear foliage. Blue Senecio is a great combo filler plant with its cylindrical leaves poking straight up. This is sometimes called blue chalk sticks because of the dusting of the grayish blue bloom on the foliage. 
Fire Sticks Euphorbia almost has a coral-like appearance. The loosely branched vertical stems display a distinctive golden reddish color. And Hobbit Jade Plant produces stubby, two-inch long tubular shaped leaves with curled edges. This is another succulent that takes on a sea coral appearance. You don't need a magic spell to successfully grow sedums and succulents. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a big celebration. We look back at this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. This was the 51st year. It goes all the way back to 1970. It's a big deal, of course, promoting 4-H and FFA livestock programs in Mississippi. We'll meet a couple of these talented, hardworking kids who put everything they've got into this event every year. The Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Time for the markets. Zach Ashmore in the studio practicing social distance. Needless to say, coronavirus affecting just about everything in the markets, right? That's right, Mike. COVID-19 has made markets hazy. Up one day, down the next. Analyst Tom Fitzenmeyer and Matt Bennett say it may be a while before we're through the clouds. It, it's really just a negative psychology all the way around. It's sort of a, a get out first and ask questions later kind of a situation. And it doesn't help in the, in the grain markets that we're probably, we have abundant supplies. So that, that doesn't help any either. Well, I think there's a connection for, by all means. Uh, the thing that you got to remember is it's kind of a deflationary uh, tone that we started off the week with, with crude just absolutely getting smoked on Sunday night. Uh, you come in here and uh, you, I was, uh, I guess, a little bit encouraged that corn didn't get hurt worse on Monday than what it did whenever you looked at uh, what was going on with the crude oil market. But yes, we're certainly tied together. Uh, when you start looking at, for instance, uh, uh, protein and, and what happened, you know, in the livestock industry uh, this week, I mean, there's a lot of uh, frustration uh, folks at this point in the game and, and I think that uh, seeing the corn market only down a dime on the week actually uh, it could have been much worse than that. In my mind it's going to take probably six weeks to kind of work our way through all this and then you're starting to get into we got crop intentions at the end of the month and you know what's that going to so surveys I've seen seem to somewhat support what the USDA was projecting um, and, and then you know spring weather which is which can yeah, everybody's a little go goosey about 
wetness because of last year. So that's probably going to be a little bit of a supportive factor, I would guess, going into the spring. Grains continue to decline. Soybeans seem worse for wear. Tom and Matt say that's because of trade issues. A rally is certain, but we don't know when, obviously. You know, for soybeans, the profit margins don't look good whatsoever there either. It's, it's, and, and I don't want to joke about it. I mean, this is a frustrating situation. Going out and doing meetings right now is one of the more harrowing things that uh, I've done for quite some time because it's not pleasant uh, to talk about exactly what's going on. But at the same time, just because something's not pleasant to talk about doesn't mean that we don't need to talk about it. So we got to figure out what we're going to do, have a game plan. Because if you do get a rally in here, I don't think that you better uh, be expecting it's going to be near as big as what we saw last year. Well, we're banking on a, a bunch of business with China that doesn't look like it's going to happen, certainly for a while. Maybe this summer it will, but it's not going to happen for a while. So you've got that de demand. Exports are horrible and, and we had cancellations in beans from China this week. So I, beans, have, beans have got problems that are, that are going to make it really difficult for that market to rally. And, and I think Matt's probably right on the acreage, but that's probably enough acres, if, especially if you have a trend line yield again. So I, I, I don't know if there's any, I, I'm, certainly we'll have, probably have a recovery rally. That not, wouldn't be a surprise, but I don't, wouldn't get my hopes real high on how far that could carry. I mean, they're going to be able to buy a copious amount if that's what they're going to do. Now, we all know they've had a heck of a time just getting ships offloaded. So what's the logistics of that? What, when are we going to see that happen? And I think you're going to probably see it happen farther out as far as shipments are concerned. But sales, if this market goes down much more, I think you could start seeing maybe some sales. But again, you know, I think Tom would agree with me. We're going to rally at some point this year. The scary thing is we don't know where it's going to be from. Cattle markets fared no better. With uncertainty, prices dropped. But there may be a speck of hope in the future. Once again, Tom and Matt. Well, I think there's some concern about demand, particularly from the restaurant side. Um, th that, that's number one. And, and, the, and the one that's been bothering me for a, a week or two here now, so, sort of hit us on Friday, is that there's some talk about the possibility of employees of packing plants contracting this disease and what the impact that could be on the ability to slaughter. And so, and so if you start backing cattle up on, on us here, that, that's going to be a problem. I think home, home gr the grilling season, for example, I think, and home grilling and home meat consumption is probably going to be quite good. But that restaurant thing is a, is a big part of the demand for beef. Oh, you know, that's the thing is that most people look at grilling season as the opportunity that we're actually going to, you know, see a, a bump up in demand and you're going to see prices uh, stabilize. But it, this is a different beast that we're dealing with. It's, it, none of us knows how this is going to turn out. None of us knows when this is going to peak. Uh, we don't know when people are going to feel comfortable going back into restaurants. Yes, grilling season, you're going to have a fair amount of demand yet, but Tom's right. Uh, Go, people going out for a good steak dinner is something that uh, uh, you know that is a huge has a huge impact as far as the beef market's concerned and the cattle market's concerned. Uh, this is uh, this is a tough thing, and I think the thing that concerns me more than anything is that you know for the long time it seemed like the cattle producers w was rewarded the front month stuck around and stuck around and, and allowed them uh, to maybe not market a whole lot and still be able to make some money. Uh, we had this huge inverted market, and the front months were profitable. We don't have that today, and, and, and the deferred months aren't profitable either, and this, this, is, this concerns me a great deal. But at this stage of the game, I mean, if I had a bunch of feeders to sell, I would certainly be frustrated. If I was looking to buy feeders, I'd probably feel a little bit better about it, but still, whenever you do the numbers and you buy feeders, you buy your feed, and you look at fats, it doesn't work. I don't think the cash... Um, feeder market's going to drop like the, like that seventeen dollar drop we saw in the future. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 but I did, it could create an opportunity, especially if corn gets cheaper, yeah. to to pick up some to, p to pick up some calves at a, at a decent level. Hope for a pop up and 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 maybe not have that bad a year as as cattle producers. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Man, twenty twenty has been a weird year so far. Let's hope for a comeback, Mike. Here's another story produced just before the world went upside down with the outbreak, the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. It's one of the most beloved livestock events of the year, and we're happy to take a look back at this year's sale. It took place on February 6th at the State Fairgrounds in Jackson, Mississippi. We're excited to have you here at the 
51st annual Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. We're going to have a great day today. And with those words, Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson kicked off the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, the 51st year of the sale, all part of the biggest livestock event every year in the Southeast. And they're going to go for a high, high price, aren't they? I guarantee you. And they did too, more than 2,200 animals that sold for a record amount, topping $404,000. It even beat last year's jaw-dropping record of $382,000. Pretty amazing when you remember that all this livestock was raised and cared for by more than 1,600 hardworking youth in 4-H and FFA. The sale, as they call it, showcases the efforts of all these young people, and no one is prouder of them than Commissioner Gibson. The greatest investment you and I can make is in our young people, and that's why we're here today, because our youth are our future, and our future is very bright as a result. The same for Dr. Reuben Moore, a leader of ag, forestry, and vet medicine at Mississippi State University. The things it teaches them, the, the work ethic, the how to win and lose. You know this life is full of, of wins and losses, successes and failures. And these, these young people that go through this, they know how to face that when you get into later life. Over the last half century, the sale has been prominent in the lives of countless young men and women in so many ways. Raising and showing their animals, of course, they learn responsibility, leadership, tenacity, even economics. And for these folks, livestock buyers and contributors, it's a chance not only to snag some quality animals, but to help the young competitors fund their college educations. A couple of them supported high school senior Elizabeth Nichols, who was a big winner, two showmanship scholarships, and sold two animals, the grand champion lamb and a reserve champion market goat, for a combined $15,000. It was her ninth year of competition. I've always been a big showmanship person. I've really focused on really pushing myself to be the best in the showmanship classes. I've always kind of had a natural talent for that and I think that I really like showing the judge how I can show the lamb. For Elizabeth, like a lot of the other eager contestants, it's a daunting challenge trying to maintain grades, hang out with friends, and participate in extracurricular events, all on top of taking care of the animals. Personally, I think the hardest part is trying to balance keeping up with your animals and the responsibility with your social life, because everybody's busy outside. I, I do cheerleading, and all of my school activities. It's hard to balance those two lives together, but I think that's the hardest part, but still in the end, it's the most rewarding to stick through with the 4-H project. This program has brought me so many memories and friendships that will last a lifetime. Another big winner, Lacey Rains, also a high school senior. She didn't have an animal in the sale, but was an academic scholarship winner. She's been showing market goats for 10 plus years, but back at the beginning, it was all a big mystery. She got into it because her brother did. We had no idea what we were getting into. When my brother came to my mama and said, I want to show goats, she said, what? So we had no idea. Life is no different for Lacey. There's a lot to be done. Um, you have to, it's a lot of hard work and dedication. You have to get up early in the mornings to go feed and feed again in the evening. You have to make sure that they're taken care of to um, be able to show to the best of their ability. And it doesn't matter if it's pouring down rain, freezing, uh, snowing, like you, they still have to be fed so that they can live and you can show them. I show livestock, I'm on our bowling team, our archery team, uh, student body president, <laughs> and anchor club president, so I have a lot of stuff going on. As soon as I get back this afternoon, I have an archery match. So, <laughs> After all these years showing animals, does Lacey still get the jitters like she did at the beginning? I don't really get nervous anymore since I've been showing for so long. Sometimes I get nervous when I come to the big shows like Dixie Nationals, but I'm more nervous outside. Once I get in the ring, it's like I'm at home and I just forget everything else and just focus on the showing. I do get nervous at the bigger shows because there's so much competition, but I just have to have faith that what me and my family have done to prep the animal over the past year and I just have to have faith that our hard work will pay off. But I do get nervous in the ring still after nine years. 
Both young ladies are headed to college, Lacey for a degree in agriculture, Elizabeth for a degree in radiation therapy. They will take with them some fond memories of competition and friendships. Will they miss the big stage of the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions? It's been hard, so I think it'll be a new phase in my life for sure. But I think I'm for sure going to miss the environment and the family and getting to come to Dixie National and show with everybody. I will for sure miss it. I will definitely miss it. Um, I don't really know what I'm going to do with myself after I'm done showing, but I'll definitely be back if I can be to watch my fellow showmen. I have some younger ones that are coming in under me that I'm going to try to help. This is the cream of the crop. This is the future of the state of Mississippi. Let's give these young people a round of applause. Thank you for all you do. Some very proud kids at the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Well, next time on the show, and Zach's going to help me here, 200 years ago, much of the land in our country was prairie land. Over time, millions of acres were plowed under to feed us or paved over to move us. Now, though, one special company in Minnesota is helping to fuel a movement to restore some of that land to its original beauty. It's called Prairie Moon, and it's one of the most unusual businesses in the nation. That's next time on Farm Week. And before we say goodbye, you probably remember that actor Tom Hanks and his wife Rita Wilson had the virus and were hospitalized in Australia. While they were in, they had a contest to name a music playlist they created. One of their followers came up with Quarantunes. Here's the tweet <laughs> announcing the winner. Here are a couple of the songs. Zach, you go first. Well, how about Rockin' Pneumonia and the Boogie Woogie Flu by Johnny Rivers? <laughs> and here's one, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Good advice, <laughs> Bobby McFerrin. Well, that's all the time we have. Stay healthy. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.